In the 1830s and 1840s, it was a, a pioneering element in the world. Um, no one had actually uh, lived on the Falklands. And curiously, you see, in other parts of the world, um, people moved in, but there was always a native population. But we never had a native population here, so we, we didn't take the land away from anyone. So there was this mental challenge, if you like, in the 1830s. People in England thought they might be able to develop a farming community in the Falklands, and it was a big challenge. So people came out as immigrants to this new land where there was absolutely nothing at all in the way of amenities, and they, they had to start up their farms, their businesses. Stanley was nothing. It was just a bare hillside, so they had to um, bring all their stores, the buildings, the families, the, uh, the, the food, um, landed on, the, on an open beach in Stanley and then build their houses. There, there was nothing here which they could take over or move into. They just had to, to start from scratch. They, they lived in tents in some cases on the shore in Stanley and uh, just developed as they built things, they lived in there. And Stanley just grew up. A party of sappers and miners, and there were 12 of them, with um, Lieutenant Governor Moody, laid the foundations of Stanley. And they, at, at some point, they brought their families around from Port Louis. And as the, um, as the town gradually um, became livable and usable, um, more people came around from Port Louis. Some people had been allowed to buy land in Port Louis, including some of the sappers, and they were able to exchange their pot plots of land in Port Louis for a plot of land in Stanley. So it was sort of a dream come true for an ordinary sapper who probably in previous postings had only been able to accommodate his family in a in one room in a tenement building in military barracks and suddenly they were able to buy a plot of land on the seafront build a small house in 1842 by september 1843 the first buildings had been started and in 1844 only four people were going to stay at Port Louis, the rest were going to move into Stanley. And by the winter of 1846, the streets were laid out, um, and that'll be the same as they are in the old part of Stanley now on the grid system. And a uh, number of essential buildings had been constructed. Because of our situation, the majority of the businesses were, um, were to do with shipping. And then you had the other element, which was to do with farming. So the farm started, uh, Stanley happened, and then we had the great shipping boom. Because, curiously, the discovery of gold in California in the 1840s put Stanley on its feet. You know, they, they discovered gold in California, and thousands of people wanted to get, to get to the gold fields so the only way they could do it was to sail down the Atlantics um, round Cape Horn and then up the west coast to South America to the gold fields and Stanley was the only sort of stopping place on the way. The, the east part gradually developed down as far as the cemetery and that's where it stopped for a very long time. At one time Ross Road East was a very highly sought after place to live. That's as far east as the town went for a very long time, really. And it stopped to the west, m almost at Government House, only slightly past Government House. But it was mainly set centred around the shoreline because that was the means of transport for everything that came in and out.
Stanley grew out uphill um, rather quicker than it did to the east. And there were a few little houses to the east. There was a dairy down there. And to the west, there were, because there was a, a jetty, um, and there were a few houses far west, about as far as the beaver hangar, but nothing beyond that, really. In the 1960s, the town was bordered by Snake Hill, Davis Street, and Government House was a little bit further west. But that was the main town. Pre-war, the, pop the population was going down. It was decreasing. Um, right through the from the 1950s, it was, was slowly going down because there weren't many opportunities for Falkland Islanders. And a lot of the young people went away to Australia, New Zealand, to the UK. Then, of course, once um, communication started with the Argentines and things were looking more and more doubtful. Um, again, people were moving out. They weren't waiting to live here under a possible Argentine government if there'd been a handover by the British government. And nowadays when we're talking about the islands, uh, many, many times we have to say, well, before 1982 and explain how things were to get the picture into context. Now, other people gradually or assume that we uh, we had communication in all respects before 1982, but before 1982 there was only a boat once a month to Montevideo. Um, there were times with a flight to uh, Commodore Rivadavia and thence to Argentina and thence to London, but usually it was once a month. Even with um, the way of life with with gardening and vegetables, now we go down to the store and buy whatever we want. Before 1982, we all had our own gardens. Each house in Stanley was built on a plot of land of an eighth of an acre. So we take so many things for granted, and to our newcomers, we've got to explain you know, what it was like beforehand.